So to sort of truncate all this profanity, we'll, um, Ken will explain what these things are, and then we'll play with them just for a few minutes, and that will settle our breakfast and settle our minds and to set us up for what is to come. Ken, what can you say about these? This is Ken Symington, the best psychedelic CEO on the West Coast. <laughs> Ex-CEO. Ex-CEO. <laughs> well, Terence is always talking about the influence of sound on the brain, so I thought that this would be a good thing that he would want to try. These are replicas of Chimu pots, and they were made in northwestern Peru from about 1,000 uh, B.C. to about 1,000 or 1,500 A.D. So they're very, very old, and they found thing, these things all over excavations in Peru, and the net result is nobody knows what they were used for. Uh, but they're hollow pots, and... Uh, it has been found that if you blow on this end and the air comes out of a little hole in this one, it creates a very peculiar sound. And I skipped describing it, David. I'd like you to try it. And if you blow, and if you, especially if you blow the seven, you begin to hear a lot of things, which are very peculiar sounds. And people who have been using them have found that it affects in some way their their psyche. And even if it doesn't affect your psyche, the effect of the sound is very peculiar. And all you have, it, you hear it right away. You begin to hear all kinds of different levels of sound. So all, and you begin to hear it immediately. So uh, if you'd like, if we could have, if Terence will blow one and I will blow one, and if you, we could have 500 people, we'll just blow on them for about three, four minutes. And the effect is uh, most noticed uh, among the people that are blowing, but not only that. I think it, excuse me, I think it would help if you were to play all close, you know. Yeah, we'll make a circle. This is what's called acoustical driving. You've, you're familiar with it from drums, but uh, this is a technology of which we have nothing comparable. This is an example of a culturally state-bounded psycho psychic uh, technology. You have to imagine that you're stoned on San Pedro or ayahuasca and that we're going to do it for several hours, but we're not. Um, can you stand up and dance when we've done it long enough, okay? <laughs> Or something. <laughs> well, the important thing is, you know, you just start all at once, and obviously you'll run out of breath. So you take it easy, you just take another breath and keep on going. You know, you just blow right, right after the other. Don't blow too hard because then the sound gets distorted. So you just blow naturally in it so you can get the whistle in. And then when you run out of breath, you take another breath and blow in. And that's as simple as that, and we'll see what happens. Why don't we... Why don't you start, and you come in, and you, and you, and you, and then we'll all sustain the tone for a while. And this piercing sound continues for another four minutes. However, I felt that you would probably thank me for cutting it short. think we can take it on the road? <laughs> well, that was pretty interesting. Well, where should we go for our hearing test? <laughs> <laughs> that, it's, that's what it sounded like. I had never done it before. Ken told me about it last night. Well, that's pretty interesting. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard it, but... Um, when you smoke DMT, the the sound that comes through, the previous association that I've always made to that sound is the uh, standard hui, hui, hui of flying saucers in 1950s science fiction movies, you know, that... This is clearly the same kind of thing, and... Uh, 
I don't know what this rising, uh, I don't actually know enough of the vocabulary of talking about sound to know how you distinguish and talk about this, but it's clearly very neurologically, it's almost like tintinitis or something ringing in the ears, but much more intense. The other thing that I hadn't anticipated that surprised me is uh, this is a natural sound in the ecosystem where it came from. This is what the night insects sound like. You know, it sounds like this comes from the northeastern deserts of Peru. That would be a San Pedro area where mescaline is uh, what's uh, being used by the people. But there's fair evidence of trade back and forth between the Amazon and this area. I think this would be dynamite if you were stoned. In fact, it might even be a bit much. Uh, the... This is one of these areas where I think, you know, probably in six weeks, uh, inspired uh, hearing specialists, neurophysiologists could figure out, I mean, what is this driving and why does it affect these drug states? Very, very early this was discovered. Drumming is the classical way to do it. But now an interesting thing about uh, the Amazon cultural area is the humidity is so high that a stretched skin drum is impossible. It can only maintain its uh, stretched state for hours at most, sometimes minutes. So the drums of the Amazon are the huge kind of drums where you take a hardwood log and burn out the center over a period of weeks and then you get this very low resonance because of the cavity inside the log. Um, this may be, in a sense, a substitute for the skin drum. I, th I think it's a much more effective uh, one. The drumming has never particularly done it for me in, except that it induces a kind of state of uh, withdrawal from sensory input from the environment. You know, you just kind of sink into it. So if any of you are experimentalists or headed for a career in medical research or something like that, these are the kinds of... Uh, of things that lie right on the surface to, that need to be looked into before we go deeper. Uh, is Do things like this imply perhaps more advanced technologies? Uh, what can you do with a synthesizer? Uh, we don't know what values they were trying to achieve with their sound, so we don't know whether they regarded these as a, a perfect instrument for what they were trying to do or an unfortunate approximation. We'll probably never know because the people who made these things uh, did no writing. But uh, sound as the synergy of thought is... Uh, you know, a very general principle, and it also has the very specific uh, concrescence into language. Language is sound that stimulates thought. So this is, uh, this is very interesting. Interesting, the worldwide reliance on sustained tone in, in spiritual exploration. I mean, whether you get, you know, Tibetan chanting, Gregorian chant, the keening that typifies uh, Arabic music, the multi-layered weaving of sound that characterizes the Amazon rainforest ayahuasca songs, or something like this, or a Shanai. All of these are... Uh, techniques for creating a wall of sound onto which then mind is for some reason easily projected, almost as though there is a carrier wave necessary. We don't know. 
I mean, there is there are hints in the ancient literature that uh, a technology, a sensitivity to sound and resonance was part of a kind of lost science that existed in antiquity. This would be a point of view that would see Pythagoras not as the founder and discoverer of music and proportion and number, but would rather see Pythagoras as rather a late manifestation of a way of knowing that involved uh, um, sound and resonance and proportion and using interference patterns uh, to create all kinds of effects in the human mind and the human body. So this is an example of a culture-bound technology directed toward affecting and driving uh, a mental state. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I've had an experience, something that's been happening in the last couple of years, and some of my friends have had the same thing, where there's this tone that comes in the air. You mean during the mushroom experience? No, just walking around during the day, and it'll come in like a real high-frequency tone, and it almost sounds exactly like that. It feels like it goes to the middle of your head. And... I don't know if it's something people talk about, or but it doesn't seem to be something wrong with my ear, because some of my other friends have been having the same thing. It seems to be happening more and more often. Well, as we get older, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there you you all know about this stuff called tintinitis, right? This is literally ringing in the ears. If you've ever gotten into a deep flu or something and abused aspirin. If you take uh, six hours or ten aspirin over a 12-hour period, your ears will ring like crazy. I mean, you can't even hear what people are saying to you. Quinine. This was the big problem with quinine until chloroquine and these more fancy things like Fancidar were invented for malaria. Yes, uh, British uh, colonial administrators condemned themselves to a life of gin addiction and ringing ears uh, in order to be in these quinine zones. Uh, There is a whole medical literature on tintinitis. I don't quite understand uh, what it is. Um... Uh, Another phenomenon that I don't think has been described in the literature that puzzles me, and it's hard to talk about or confirm with people because it's extremely brief and ephemeral, but since this is a sophisticated room full of travelers, maybe there can be feedback on this. I've noticed this thing in mushrooms um, above five grams where there is what I call the zinger, And the zinger, it feels like a cosmic ray that your body is detecting. It lasts only about that long. It lasts a fraction of a second. And it's like an electrical reset of your whole body. And it just, it's a zing. And it goes through and it's very intense and it lasts a fraction of a second. And about the only thing you can say about it is, it would probably be quite alarming if it lasted even slightly longer, but it never does. It feels like a high-speed particle just passed through your frontal lobes or something. Do you, any of you know what I'm talking about? So this is not me advancing into senility. This is, uh, And I don't know what that is. Again, if you had somebody fully wired up, to an EEG and everything else, this would have to show up. This is clearly a gross neurological phenomenon. This is not a hallucination in the ordinary sense. Well, again, because no legal research can be done on human beings and mice cannot report these kinds of phenomena, we're just at sea. And throughout the weekend, whenever there's an opportunity to indicate a place where experimental strategies might be helpful, I'll try to mention it, because I, my fantasy is that some of you are the neurophysiologists, neuropsychopharmacologists, psychotherapists of the future, and that, you know, once 
you get your $5 million NIMH grant, you'll remember what old Professor McKinney said <laughs> and create protocols to look into some of these things. I mean, it is not for want of of experimental approaches that experiment floundered. It was for want of courage on the part of the scientific community to carry out that kind of work. Obviously, the people who built these things had no such qualms. Uh, they, they were going for it. Charles, can I say something? I'd like to address your comment. Uh, I basically couldn't even practice in the psychic, and my experience is that when you have the sounds coming in, what's happening with your total happy channels are going to gaps and stuff. And, and I think that that's what those do as well. I worked with the pipes with um, Emily Conrad Dell about six years ago for the first time, and my sense is what they do literally is they open the auditory voice channels and the telepathic channels, which all are in this general area of the skull, as well as doing some rattling of the teleceptors. And the, the phenomenon of suddenly hearing this high-pitched pitch frequency when you don't have a cold, you don't have a sinus condition, you're not taking aspirin, generally, from my experience, has indicated that someone is accessing the tool path and it's a form of communication that comes in at this vibration level you're beginning to pick it up but you can't fine tune it to hear it yet is it the pineal going through its tune? it's actually the hypothalamus do you mean uh, that they're accessing you in the sense that they're leaving a message in your yeah. psychological yeah. electronic mailbox that's right <laughs> <laughs> I never check mine. I, I should go. <laughs> you really should. You probably don't Well, I, for three months, all that was there was ads for cheap blank tape. So. <laughs> yeah. There might be some parallel. It's a, a common way to deal with pain now is to create a sensation in another part of the body. Uh, through an electronic surgery instrument or something. Uh, I mean, this could be just a way of uh, distracting the mind while it's in the process. Well, or not so much distracting it, but uh, focusing it upon itself. Because I noticed, you know, Ken didn't give a lot of instructions, but I immediately closed my eyes, leaned into it, and there seemed to be a set of reflexes, not specifically associated with just blowing on it, um, Yes, anything which can lead us into these places. Uh, and tone is very important. I mean, I wish I had a vocabulary for music because I've had experiences with music that were just so freaky that I couldn't, um, I could barely put up with it. But I'm not a musician. So I couldn't come down and discuss what had happened in terms of the quality of the shift. But I remember a, a couple of years ago in, in Hawaii, a friend of mine had made recordings of African, I'm sorry, of Afghani tribal people. And it is this, it's drums and high-pitched flutes. It's overkill on the shamanic instrument thing. It's this hard-driving drum and, uh, and then these wandering high-pitched flutes. And I f could not stand to listen to it. It was so freakish in some way that I couldn't talk about because I don't have the vocabulary. But even to this day, when I listen to that music, a sense, I hear behind it I hear into something, and, and I felt, you know, that these guys were not human beings, that nobody could do what they were doing, that, I, that that was all a mask, and that there was something coming out of, uh, you know, the Caucasus, Central Asia, 20, 50, 60,000 years old, that was really um, bizarre, yeah. Well, I keep in mind, too, any kind of... Uh clear tonal matrix uh, such as white noise or rushing water, which is a form of white noise, is like a perfect background on which to hear voices. 
to project. Yeah. Yes, although this is not white noise. Right. This is very yeah, almost the antithesis of white the noise. I see could be uh, could serve the same purpose. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, white noise is wide spectrum sound. It sounds like this. You can always hear white noise if you need to on a trip by turning on the FM radio and off-tuning a channel if you don't have automatic lock. Off-tune it and then to the side of a strong channel there will always be white noise. Uh, I had a strange experience uh, when I was in the Amazon. There's a Celtic saying that poetry is made at the edge of running water. I think Robert Graves discusses this in The White Goddess, which if you've never read The White Goddess, that's basic reading for psychedelicos. And so he talks about this Celtic saying, poetry is made at the edge of running water. Well, then I was in the Amazon and I was um, uh, quite saturated with psychoactive tryptamines and I and there was a waterfall and I noticed that as I walked toward the waterfall my thoughts fell into rhyme and this is something I don't write rhyming poetry it's not my metier and I don't suppose it was great poetry but it was pretty astonishing to not be able to break out of the rhyme scheme. And I remember there were things like, uh, the clone's mode is a stoned load. <laughs> <clears throat> that was one of these things. And I went to the waterfall and I sat by it, and as long as I would sit by it, my most trivial thoughts would organize themselves into this doggerel this rhyming cadence. Well, then when I left the waterfall, subject to the inverse square law, these rhymes fell away. Well, this is mighty, mighty peculiar. I mean, what's going on here? First of all, what is rhyme? What is the thinking mind that it can slip from rhyming to prose? And then what does this have to do with white noise? You see, I think a creative, uh, a psychedelically inspired acoustical and linguistic laboratory could put pressure on these things. It seems as though the coding and encoding and the production and interpretation of these codes is very close to the surface. It almost seems as though there is no transformation of language that you can imagine that doesn't happen on these things. I mean, I had a trip a few months ago where something happened that I had never seen happen before, which was my thoughts were proceeding along in front of me and I was uh, in pretty good shape. And then... Um, you know the thing, the news flasher in Times Square with the news running across? Well, they, my thoughts shifted into that. It was like a teletype output. It was printed and flowing along. And so I'm no longer thinking my thoughts. I'm reading my thoughts as they flow past my eye. So I'm thinking, that's pretty weird. And then I notice that uh, some of the words are misspelled. <laughs> I, have, I, I am not a good speller so, but I noticed that some of the words that I know how to spell were misspelled and then as I watched certain words no lo were so misspelled that they no longer uh, I couldn't figure out what they were well then I noticed more and more words were slipping into this mode and after about a minute and a half what was going by my perceiving mind was gibberish but printed gibberish and I had watched my own thoughts degrade into chaos on this ribbon and I just thought my god you know what is this meaning works its magic and then it lifts its magic hand and meaning falls into chaos. And it's all showing it to me within the context of uh, the phonetic alphabet. Weird, 
stuff, degradation of meaning, visible degradation of meaning. The babbling brook. The babbling brook. I used to have an English teacher who began each class by saying, I'll brook no babbling. <laughs> Must have had the Joyce meme. <laughs> well, these things are very suggestive and very important to um, the larger uh, interpretation of all this stuff, which I'm trying to get to, uh, because transformation of language is somehow critical. This is what these things are working on. Uh, this may be entirely the domain in which they operate when it's sufficiently broadly... Um, defined, it always seems to present and offer metaphors about, uh, about meaning. And I think some of you have been present when I've told the story about the time years and years ago when I uh, was in the habit of taking LSD and then smoking DMT on the top of it. I don't recommend this. This is a young... You have to have a young body for this or, or be crazy or something. But anyway, I, I, I was, this was a strategy I used with the LSD in order to prolong the DMT flash. Well, in a particular instance, I was, it was Christmas vacation in Berkeley in the house I was living in. Everyone had left and no one was due back for a week. So I had perfect confidence that I could do this and not be interrupted. So I took the LSD. An hour and a half later, I got the DMT pipe, and I did it, and it did prolong it, and it was spectacular, and I won't say too much about that. But right in the middle of it, the woman who lived upstairs returned unexpectedly from Christmas vacation, and ran up the rickety front steps and started beating on the glass door and just shaking the house. Well, I'm a basically paranoid person anyway. <laughs> I mean, if I'm 300 miles up the Yaguas Yasu in Colombia and I'm out in the jungle smoking a joint and a twig snaps, <laughs> the first thing I do is hide my dope and then see what's going on. So, uh, when this beating on the front door began, I suffered uh, probably a minor coronary thrombosis, and I jumped up off my bed, I was propelled off my bed, and landed on my feet in the middle of the room, and then, to my horror and disbelief, realized that I had somehow ruptured the plane and that this stuff had all come with me. And these self-transforming, elf-machine, hyper-dimensional things that I call the tykes were in the room with me. And it was no longer behind closed eyes in darkened space. Uh, they were interposing themselves between me and the bookcase and the window and everything there and turning me around. And uh, there was a machine hovering in the air, one of these DMT Fabergé carved ivory eggs with the inner locking and all colors and jewels and metal and liquid crystal thing in the air, and it had a projecting facet coming off of it. And this thing was ratcheting with this clicking sound. And every time it would ratchet, and it was doing this very quickly, a small plastic chit... Uh, a triangular chit would be hurled off of this thing and each chit had a character on it a letter in an, an, in an alien language and these things were flying across the room and hitting the wall and bouncing off the ceiling and the whole room was full of these flying letters in this alien language, these squealing elves uh, running around, and I was spontaneously speaking in some kind of glossolalia, which was itself causing objects to condense in the room. And it was just, you know, it was too much, clearly. And I 
was able to go to the door of the room, slide open the door. By then, this woman had found her keys and was standing in the living room. I took one look at her. I spoke a very high-volume paragraph in Martian B (laughs) and slammed the door and just went back and put my head in the corner. Well... It it was an extreme example of its involvement with this linguistic domain. It's always trying to say something about coding and symbols and sounds and language and, uh, and intentionality. This lies very, very close to the surface uh, in these places. So if you should ever find yourself in these places, uh, experiment with meaning and voice and song and acoustical driving as we did, uh, as we did here this morning. I think that's really the, the fertile dimension. And uh, I mentioned the white goddess. What Graves is saying in there is that there was a kind of um, poetic language in our racial past, in our species past, that there is a kind of language which is in the bone. It isn't culturally conventionalized. You don't have to take three years to learn it as an infant. It simply proceeds out of animal organization. Well, it may well be that that language is the only language in which we can really communicate our feelings and that our our, uh, blocked access to communication of feelings has to do with the fact that we're using a lower dimensional language uh, to try and describe them. They are, after all, higher dimensional objects, our feelings. And when we just slice through them and say rage, lust, disgust, you know, it's much more complicated than that. Well, we sort of got out in front of ourselves here this morning, but it's okay. Now you've seen the end, so now you're all shamans, so now we'll uh, go back into uh, the matrix. What I would like to do is... um, go through this historical scenario, some of you may groan inwardly because you've heard it before, but there's more data. And my goal is to make it as tight, as rhetorically tight as possible so that it can resist attack, which is sure to come. Because what I want to say ultimately is that uh, the program of understanding human origins that begins with Darwin in the 19th century has only proceeded about halfway. What outraged the Victorian mentality so much was the suggestion that human beings are descended from the apes, the anthropoid proto-hominid primate line. This is now fairly well accepted and to my mind to a degree too accepted because the Darwinian scenario cannot account for the emergence of mind over so short a span of time. Either something has been left out or uh, we're on the wrong track entirely. So I will go over this, some of it fairly quickly, parts that I've lectured a lot in the past, and then some of it more slowly, new stuff that I've unearthed in the process of uh, writing this book for Bantam. I believe what I'm about to tell you, but notice that whether you believe it or not, it is a political argument for our position for the position that psychedelics, especially psychedelic plants, had a tremendous impact on human origins and are shaping the human present and future. Um, It begins, like so many things that have happened on this planet, with climatological change. Uh, Glaciation, 
which has happened, I don't know, six, eight times in the last three or four million years, is uh, a new phenomenon in the life of this planet. Glaciation wasn't happening when the dinosaurs were around. It wasn't happening uh, in the Devonian. It is something new. So after five billion years of existence, the planet Earth brought forth a new phenomenon, the, re- the repetitious descent of glacial ice from the poles. Now this probably has to do with an accumulating planetary instability. And we'll talk about this more. There is an accumulating planetary instability. The last hundred million years have been the most dynamic in the history of the Earth since its formation. Of that hundred million years, the last ten million has been the most dynamic. Of that ten million, the last million. Of that million, the last ten thousand. So the planet is fluctuating. Now we're on the scene. We are causing planetary fluctuations of a sort never before seen. I don't know how many of you saw the article in the New York Times, but uh, 1987 was the warmest year in 44 million years, they estimate. And 1988 was slightly warmer. Now, we're wait, everybody's, uh, the scientists are waiting for a trend to establish because they can't believe that on such a, sh- with, the, with such a short amount, uh, such a small data sample, you can make these extrapolations. Nevertheless, it's anecdotally understood in the scientific community that we are now in a process of human generated Uh, planetary changes. Well, we emerged in a context of planetary change. For a very long time, uh, the warm tropics of the Earth were covered by climaxed rainforests. And then this glaciation thing began, and when ice concentrates at the poles, grasslands appear in the tropics because there is restricted rainfall. There are also theorists who hold that human burning then contributes to the appearance of the grasslands and stabilizes them. Uh, Carl Sauer of the University of California at Berkeley, eminent geographer, takes the position that there are no natural grasslands on this planet, that all grassland is an artifact of human impact. Uh, In any case, our previous many millions of years had been spent in the trees as insect-eating, fruit-eating, arboreal primates with a tribal habit, a small but growing repertoire of pack signals, and uh, developing binocular vision in order to coordinate this swinging from limb to limb mode that we had. When protein got tight, when pressure got on, we were forced out of the trees and onto the grasslands where uh, we adapted an omnivorous dietary habit out of necessity because there was not enough to eat. So you either test new foods or die. This is the choice. Well, in that process, many creatures many individual creatures become extinct. But certain fortunate individuals actually discover new sources of food. Okay, Uh, new sources of food. This uh, gives them an opportunity basically to continue existing. But, and I mentioned this last night, the problem with wide-scale testing of new foods in a species is uh, plants evolve what are called secondary byproducts to protect themselves from insect predation uh, to 
uh, buffer incoming mineral salts to make themselves attractive to pollinate or insects, a vast panoply of secondary byproducts are evolved in plants. Well, if you're an organism testing plants as food, you're going to be exposed to these things. And many of them have mutagenic influence. So a sudden shift from a very focused and specialized diet to a broadened diet will show up in the fossil record as a sudden evolutionary spurt because so many mutations are being offered up to the process of natural selection. Well, um, this happened to us and all kinds of changes went on in the human form, not only the brain changes, which we're interested in, but for instance, uh, the, the loss of body hair. Why did we lose body hair? Why did we only retain it uh, in, uh, on erogenous zones and on the tops of our heads? Well, the theory about the top of the head is that... Um, one theory, not necessarily mine, is that we evolved near the seashore and that mothers could keep hold of their babies by, their, by the hair. And that so hair is something that uh, we need to have in order that we don't drift away from each other. As far as, uh, as genital hair is concerned, the best guess anybody has been able to come up with is hair is a strategy for expanding surface area. Surface area is something that is um, important in a situation where uh, chemicals are volatilizing into the air. And the idea is that we retain genital hair in order to be able to pheromonally connect with each other. This is a whole aspect of human relations that is not well understood, that we are embedded in an ambiance of human pheromones, that, uh, you know, the smell of rage, uh, the, the, the smell of maximum security prisons, uh, all of these are odors of fear, sexuality, desperation, so forth and so on. There are uh, psychiatrists who claim to be able to uh, diagnose schizophrenia by sniff. They just take a whiff of you and then they say, you know, you're okay, you're not okay. Uh, these same theorists claim that when you walk into a room, everyone involuntarily takes a breath of air. This breath of air is communicating to them on an unconscious level where it's at in that room. And you know when you walk into a room and there are two people in that room and one of them has just told the other to take a flying leap into hell, there is what we call an aura of tension. <laughs> Well, this is very deep psychological cueing that we process on an unconscious level, and much of it may be pheromonal. Most social animals regulate themselves with pheromones, bees, ants, um, even these weird uh, hairless mammals in uh, Morocco that form these huge hives under the ground they shed pheromones uh, as well. If we are not a pheromonally re regulated social species, we are probably the only one. So, and this, this bears directly on the hallucinogen question. Uh, a professor of mine years ago, Ralph Audi at UC Med Center, his theory was that hallucinogens are what he called exopheromones. They are, a pheromone is a chemical message that is passed around within a species. He thought of hallucinogens as exopheromones, meaning they were message-bearing chemicals that moved between species. And I will more or less advocate that view in a slightly circuitous form. 
anyway, here are these monkeys on the ground testing foods, uh, and these foods usher into uh, mutagenically induced changes in the human's body-mind system. Our loss of body hair, I mentioned that, the prolongation of adolescence, this is thought to be, which is called neoteny, this is something that is peculiar to the human species, not well understood. It's thought that because we have culture, we have to keep our children with us in order to teach them culture. We don't just turn them loose when they're 18 months old, and they can't even take care of themselves. You know, a, a calf or a fawn stands up and walks four hours after birth. A human infant uh, can take a very long time. So the prolongation of adolescence, the loss of body hair, all of these things may have been uh, the effect of random mutations induced by diet. Remember that mutations are always random, but they, they are given cogency and order by then undergoing the process named by Darwin natural selection. That means the mutations which confer adaptive advantage are retained. The mutations which don't confer adaptive uh, advantage, those individuals are not successfully able to reproduce and they... Uh, die. Well, I've, uh, how this relates to psychedelics is that one of the foods tested in that environment, because there were large herds of ungulate animals developing at the same time, and they clearly represented the major concentration of protein in the grassland environment. I mean, all w that was there were a few poor cereals, a few root crops, and a lot of meat on the hoof. So there was tremendous pressure to be able to utilize that meat. And that meant a, not only an omnivorous diet, but a slow shift toward a carnivorous diet. Well, that meant trailing after these ungulate herds, probably driving lions and large predators away from fresh kills. This is probably how early human populations got meat before they had uh, sufficient hunting strategies, weaponry, and language to coordinate their own live kills. Well, trailing along behind these ungulate animals on the African veldt is a perfect situation for encountering the coprophytic psilocybin mushrooms which grow in the manure of these animals. And the mushroom is a very noticeable object in the grassland environment. I mean, I've seen them in the Amazon the size of dinner plates. Well, if you're looking out over 20 acres of pasture, you can see every mushroom of that size in the pasture. I mean, they just call you to them. I mean, they are totally anomalous. And uh, any, I've seen in East Africa baboons... Uh, they love to flip over animal cow pies, you know, dung, because they find carrion beetles there, insect protein. Well, when in the period I'm talking about, insect protein was not so far behind us. And even to this day in the Amazon, certain groups of people, up to 30% of their diet is insect protein. I mean, it's very disconcerting to be chatting with a Witoto <clears throat> and have one of these big buprestids, these wood-boring, metallic wood-boring beetles about four and a half inches long. One of these guys with a tremendous metallic sound will slap against a tree and without missing a beat, a Witoto person will just reach out, grab it, rip the wing cases off, and gnaw on it like a popsicle while they're talking to you, and may even offer you a chew. They love to insert uh, grass stems down into anthills and then pull up the ants clinging to the grass stem and then put all the grass stems and the ants in a little calabash of water and grind it up with a stone 
And because ants are social insects and release pheromones, and because pheromones necessarily must be volatile to work, you get this weird, it's like camphorated Kool-Aid. And it's, you know, insect pheromone Kool-Aid refresher. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> anyway, uh, the mushroom was soon noticed and inculcated into the diet of these now... Uh, pack-hunting, semi-carnivorous, highly omnivorous pack-hunting primates. Well, uh, quickly, the first advantage that psilocybin confers on an animal or a human being is increased visual acuity. This is just something which it does, and Roland Fisher did experiments and showed this quite uh, elegantly in the late 60s although that research, too, should be duplicated. You know, does it confer increased visual acuity? Do other things confer increased visual acuity? How rare or common is this? Well, in any case, you don't have to be a, an evolutionary biologist to know that if there's a plant that gives you better vision, you're going to be a successful hunter. Therefore, uh, eating a plant which impacts on visual acuity is going to favor those animals using it. They are going to be better hunters. They are going to kill more meat. Their children are going to have more food. Women are going to find those hunters more desirable. Therefore, they will have many women. M many women means uh, in a world where fairness operates, increased opportunities to copulate. That means increased opportunities for conception. That means more children. That means a uh, successful reproductive strategy. So that single aspect of psilocybin would feed back into the human experience as a, um, a good adaptation. It's a good idea to eat mushrooms, especially if you're a hunter. But they quickly discovered that you, if you eat more mushrooms, a general state of physiological arousal follows upon the increase in visual acuity. All CNS stimulants will cause a general kind of arousal. On one level, what that means is a, great, a kind of restlessness that is usually channeled by the organism into sexual release. So psilocybin at slightly higher doses promotes sexual activity. Uh, again, this is a tremendous enhancer of the reproductive success of those individuals participating in this increased sexual activity. And there is very little doubt, just looking at the earliest stratum of religion that we possess, that uh, prehistoric religion was orgiastic, and communal, and so forth and so on. I mean, there may have been pair bonding and all that, but clearly uh, boundary dissolution through orgy and boundary dissolution through hallucinogenic plant use are were, I think, in the minds of these early people so commingled that they couldn't even be uh, teased apart. Is that the phrase? <clears throat> At higher levels than that, at higher levels than the level in which psilocybin induces sexual arousal and restlessness and that sort of thing, uh, it breaks out into the trip. Hallucinogenic, uh, you know, affects the higher cortical functions. And uh, this then is this thing about which we, sophisticated as we are, and with 10,000 years of history behind us, we are in awe of this, of what happens above 20 milligrams of pure psilocybin. For all our sophistication, we are no more able to come to terms with that than these pack-hunting proto-hominid ancestors of ours. So you see, it was a very gentle three-step seduction. Increased visual acuity, pays back in more food, more women, more children. 
slightly higher doses pay back as increased sexual activity, that also means more access to women, more children, more reproductive success. And then at a third and higher level, it feeds back as a um, transcendental experience with a peculiar bias toward language, toward spontaneous vocalization, toward um, neurological perturbation that expresses itself through small mouth noises, through the modulation of sound. You see, we are uniquely set up to uh, modulate sound. We can do it for hours without exhausting ourselves. I prove this uh, in front of you every time we do one of these things. I mean, what other human activity could we sustain at this level? And then we don't even discuss, are you exhausted from giving your talk? Are you kidding? No, it's just talk. We all do it. And yet, you know, there's a lot of muscle work going on here, a lot of breath work. Uh, so I think that the, the, the primate situation in the trees set us up for code use and pack signaling. And we observe our boreal primates to this day with complex repertoires of pack signals. And then the hunting situation on the veldt, further pressure on pack signaling. But by the time we get down onto the veldt, an interesting thing has happened. There is a division of labor now because women who are recognized to be of smaller stature and smaller bladder than men are therefore maladapted to hunting because hunting requires a certain degree of physical strength, bladder control, so forth and so on. So there was a spontaneous division of labor. Also women, by having children, and probably these women we're talking about always had at least one or two hanging off of them, they were not highly mobile. So they, it fell to them to stay near the camp, to prepare the food, but more importantly, to gather the food. And this is a, 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 an area that we haven't talked that much about. <sighs> to hunt, you must find, kill, gut, and return to camp with the game. It is, I don't, I don't want to denigrate it, as much as I have in the past because it gets people's hackles up. I mean, there, there is an art to hunting, to knowing the lay of the land, to positioning your, your people downwind and to moving game toward them and so forth. But I submit to you that the l linguistic pressure on early proto-hominids in our line, the linguistic pressure would really have been on the women well, now, why is this? It's because the task that uh, naturally evolved for the women was to gather the food. And what this means is extremely careful differentiation of minute physical differences. We've lost touch with this in the last couple of hundred years because first metal engraving and then photography made it unnecessary to create absolute languages for describing plants. But if, for instance, you look at a, an 18th century botany book, or even a modern botany book, every plant has what is called a taxonomic description. And the taxonomic description is will appear to you, if you've never seen one, as though it is written in another language. I mean, it it reads like this, leaves crenellate, glaubescent, apical bracts rotated laterally, trichomes present. What this is, is an extremely technical language for describing minute differences in structure. And this is what you have to be able to do if you're going to gather plants for food. You have to be able to say to someone, 
It's the little plant with the red berries and the white peeling bark with the gray underside to the leaves and the roots shallow. This is a complex linguistic exercise. You are distinguishing this plant from all others in the environment. Not only are there physical distinctions to be made, there are edaphic factors. This means soils. You know, is it in laterite? Is it in sand? Is it in loam? Is it in limestone? Uh, there are seasonal factors. Uh, and there may even be factors that we as moderns have lost touch with factors involving the feng shui, the geomantic energy of the land. So women were under tremendous pressure to develop advanced vocabularies, which they did. And, you know, to this day among native peoples, what anthropologists always mention without trying to seem sexist is the chattering of women. Women chatter. Women are more socialized than men. Women are more comfortable with women than men are comfortable with men or women. I mean, women talk about internal states, they talk about feelings, they talk about all kinds of things. I think that language was probably early on a prerogative of those who gathered food in order to make all these distinctions. Okay. So then what came to be out of this confluence of forces was um, what I call, following Rian Eisler, the earliest partnership society. It was a society of pastoralists because once it was understood that cattle could be domesticated, it was much more efficient to domesticate cattle than to hunt because cattle then could provide meat as needed rather than the feast-famine cycle of the hunters. Milk then comes into the picture, which is not something you get a lot of if you hunt and kill wild cattle. And uh, the mushroom, by domesticating the cattle, the mushroom supply was also insured. And human beings, cattle, and mushrooms poured themselves together into a unique confluence of uh, mutually reinforced need and intentionality that we call symbiosis. This is where there is mutual benefit to all parties. What human beings gained, I've spent some time telling you, what cattle gained from this deal was increased reproductive success, protection from predation, greater likelihood of continuous food supply, so forth and so on. What the mushroom gained from this uh, is not entirely clear. It does become semi-domesticated then. And an interesting thing that we'll see again and again in talking about these hallucinogenic plants is how many of them are related to domesticated plants. I mean, the ergot of rye, uh, even you could stretch it to include the intoxicating mead made from honey. Bees are a domesticated creature very early in the Middle East. So there's something a little eerie about the way these hallucinogens cluster right where we will find them. This isn't true in all cases, peyote, Banisteriopsis capi, uh, Tabernantha iboga. But in the major cases that have impacted human beings, it has been because they were associated with foods. Okay, uh, this partnership society that had this long association with these plants and this orgiastic religious um, thrust was producing a completely different ratio of psychic dominance in the individual members within the society than we have in our society. Specifically, what was being held down was the ego. The ego is a neurotic response to um, separateness. 
And uh, you cannot maintain your ego in the presence of strong hallucinogenic plant patterns of usage. We saw this in the 1960s. Uh, it isn't writ in adamantine that if a million people take LSD, uh, a third of them will want to join communes, you know? And yet this is what we saw. Somehow it had an impact on images of community. It mitigates against separateness. Well, it does this in a way which is very easy to understand. If every Saturday night throughout your entire life, you and the 70 people in your tribe have gathered into the longhouse and taken a strong hallucinogen which dissolves all boundaries, floods your mind with vision, impels the whole group into group sexual activity, and so there's just, you know, energy being shed on every level. It's very hard on Sunday morning to come out of that and get together your projects, your wants, your needs, so forth. It's a tremendous force for social cohesion. And I believe that the so-called dominator ego was not able to form in that situation. It, think of the ego as a kind of a tumor or a calcareous deposit in the personality, which if you keep taking large supplies of plant hallucinogens, this ego can never form. Just as it's about to form or start taking hold, here comes another dose of ego-dissolving hallucinogens, and it goes away. So we were very... we were kept from our lower nature by our symbiotic relationship to the mushrooms. They were actually enforcing uh, the impossibility of the formation of the ego. Well now, is there anything in the world that we can look at that, that would support a wild-eyed argument like that? Is there any instance where a pathological condition is being masked by plant use? Well, it so happens there is such an example. Would I have set myself up like that <laughs> if there weren't? In uh, Zaire, there is a tribal group of people who appear to be very much like the tribes surrounding them. Uh, they don't seem to have any particularly culturally distinguishing uh, differences. They eat the same diet, so forth and so on. And this diet largely consists of plantains. Plantains, as you may know, are these huge, rough bananas that you don't eat raw because they're too starchy. You have to fry them. You can, you know, they're a Chicano food item and you can buy them in good markets. And it's a big food throughout the tropics. Well, this tribe in Zaire, which was eating this food, just like all the other tribes, a peculiar factor was noted that when people from this tribe left it and went to the city, they inevitably and very quickly, like in the space of two or three months, became mentally ill, seriously mentally ill. Not most of these people, or some of these people, but every single one of these people that left the tribal group uh, became ill. Well, they were studied, and people said, you know, it was a strong example of cohesive group values, and these people were just made sick. But they were made so sick that it didn't look like a neurosis. It looked like a, a problem of some sort. Well, eventually it was understood that what was happening was these people have a defective gene for serotonin production. And in the presence of the diet that they were used to, this, this uh, defective gene was completely masked. As long as they were eating lots of plantinos, they were getting lots of serotonin, and they never developed any mental illness. But when they left the group and went to the city, they became crazy. And this is our story. This is our story. 
We are a tribe of pastoral mushroom users. And when we abandon the use of mushrooms, we become neurotic as a historical phenomenon. We become neurotic in a particular way. The ego, which is the ordinary use for the ego, is that when I'm having lunch with you, I need to have an ego, so I put food in this mouth, not that mouth. In other words, ego tells you who you are in the space-time locus. But it isn't designed to tell you how great you are or how important you are or how central you are. It's just that part of your neurophysiological processing that locates you to a space-time locus, a certain 140-pound deposit of meat that's yours. You can walk around in it. But the ego is some kind of, uh, uh, it has a tendency to grow uncontrollably. It is a cancerous, tumorous uh, kind of psychic tissue that requires a lot of hallucinogens to hold it down. Well, when uh, climatological change got going in Africa, this partnership paradise was disrupted. And uh, I think we're all familiar with the story of Genesis. Story of Genesis is the story as told of a drug bust. Somebody was told that something was illegal and that person broke the law and ate the drug that was forbidden and then God was pissed off. And it's very interesting why God was pissed off. If you read the story, you will see that God, thinking aloud, says, they will become as we are. They will become as we are. And so Adam and Eve were cast out of uh, the garden, and God set an angel at the eastern portal of Eden with a whirling sword so that no one could make their way back and our remote ancestors were condemned to a life of work and travail. Okay, my interpretation of this is, first of all, this is a story told by a dominator culture. It's the Yawa culture, the volcano storm god Yawa. So it's being told from a dominator point of view, but what it is, is it's the story of the disruption of paradise and the fall into history and an abandonment and a movement eastward. So what I think is being talked about here is this original partnership paradise in the then much wetter central Sahara and the mushroom religion finally being disturbed by increasing aridity in this area so that the story of the fall from Eden and the fall into history is the story of the breakup of the original partnership symbiosis between human beings, cattle, and mushrooms. Okay. In the Middle East, what you see in the Nile Valley and in Palestine is that before 9,500 B.C., roughly, there is about 2,000 years where there is no habitation either in Palestine or in the Nile Valley. This is, we're talking thousands of years before Egypt. There's a complete lacuna there. Uh, uh, and then around 9,500, a new kind of people come into the Middle East. And no one knows from where, and the reason no one knows from where, is because they assume they came from what Maria Gambutas and her group call Old Europe. This is Greece, Mesopotamia, southern Turkey, where a very advanced civilization is in the process of getting going. And if any of you are interested in this, Gimbutas' book, The Goddesses and Gods of Old Europe, 
will just open your eyes to the world of 15,000 years ago. But there are problems. These people coming into the Middle East and uh, the Nile Valley do not culturally match either skeletally or in the physical, you know, the flint, uh, what we would expect from a migrating uh, group coming out of old Europe. Uh, instead, they have striking similarities with the people who were existing in the central Saharan situation a, f a couple of thousand years before. These people are called Natufians, and they are a mysterious people. No one knows where they came from, and they are much more advanced than anyone who preceded them. Well, in the central Sahara, there is uh, this place called the Teseli Plateau, where there are extensive rock paintings, some of them showing shamans with mushrooms sprouting out of their bodies, holding mushrooms. There's more than one such pic uh, depiction of mushroom use. So uh, what I would like to say is that these Natufian people coming into the Middle East are the scattered remnants of the disrupted uh, partnership Eden. And they are, and in fact, they build uh, first under the uh, in-cut escarpments of cliffs is where we find the Natufian sites at El Wad in Israel, at Ein, uh, um, Ein Shalan in, uh, in um, the Negev. Big uh, overhangs and they built their camps in front of them. Well, this is exactly the situation in which the late Teseli people were building, and the painting styles and the colors and the techniques are very clearly the same. Read Mary Setgast, Plato Prehistorian, or James Mallart's book, Chattalhya Yuk, A Neolithic Town in Anatolia, and you see, you know, that the even a kind of burnished ware called Sudanese 3B that is, comes from uh, above the first cataract in Egypt is found in the Natufian graves in Palestine. Okay, that's the early Natufian wave. A thousand years later, by 8,500, uh, Jericho is being raised. And Jericho is the glory of the civilized world. There is nothing like it at 8,500 BP. It is an advanced culture apparently springing out of nothing with a tower that was, uh, you know, nothing like this has been seen previously. It's very clear that the Natufian people who were building under the rock shelves transform themselves into the people at Jericho. A thousand years after Jericho, these same people have established a number of urban centers, the most important of which is Chatal Hyoyuk on the Anatolian plain of southern Turkey. At 8,500 BC, Chatal is what Mary Setgast calls a premature burst of complexity and brilliance. I mean, it is something. You should take a look at this book by Mellart. I mean, this is a town 9,000 years old. The pyramids lie 4,000 years in the future from when this thing was built. And yet, there is glass beadwork, there is sculpture, there are uh, elaborate burials. There is, uh, it was a Taos-like structure of adobe apartment buildings. Many, many levels of habitation indicating sedentary lifestyle. In the adobe bricks, we find large grain cereals which, that are now extinct, which indicate that these people had a whole cereal technology. We find animal pens. We know they had goats, they had sheep. 
they had cattle, they had gold work, and it was all a religion of women, a religion of the great goddess. It was, I believe, the last outpost that had any connection to this earlier partnership thing in Africa. And, you know, had we the the time and the wherewithal, we could look at the pottery and the flint chipping and the charcoal data. I mean, there's plenty there to chew on to make the case. Eventually, around 6,500 BC, as Chatal Hyoyuk is reaching its climax at what's called Chatal 7F, that's the level in the stratigraphy, wheeled chariot people sweep down from the Lake Van area, the Caspian Sea, the Zagros Mountains, they have uh, wheel chariots and they have domesticated the horse. And an argument about when this happened is rampant, but uh, the date kept be, it continues to be set back. Well, the horse is the very antithesis of the cow. The cow connects you into that which, fem which feminizes, which nurtures. Uh, pastoralists tend to confine themselves to a range. They are semi-nomadic, but they have a range. What happens when you get on the back of a horse is you see that you can run away from the consequences of your actions. And you say, you know, why should we plant emmer wheat? Why should we hunt and gather food? We can plunder. We can take it away from the people who don't have what we have. We can take their women. We can take their food. We can take their land. Suddenly, you get all over from Denmark to Iran, from the central Ukraine to Morocco, you get what is called the Tanged Point Techno Complex. The tanked point techno complex simply means that suddenly there are vast amounts of chipped flint and arrowhead, greater than at any other point in the entire Stone Age, even though the Stone Age is now over and people have a bone antler and a, a primitive uh, technology working in other materials. This proliferation of these tanked points means war has come to the human world. And suddenly, sites where no walls were built for 2,000 years, walls begin to rise all over the world. And uh, it's clear that uh, there are now half